I, as Martin said, my name is Michael Cannon. I've been at the Cato Institute for 20 years now. Uh, to give you a bit of an introduction to who I am and some of the work that I've done. Uh, if, if people in this world know me for anything, it is for the role that I, oh, look at that font, uh, misrendering. Uh, it is for the role that I uh, played in some challenges to the last uh, major reform of health care in the United States. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to uh, just sort of give you an overview uh, uh, of uh, my remarks. First, uh, there will be that introduction. Uh, then I want to share with you two principles that guide my work at the Cato Institute on health reform. Uh, then we're, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how free markets, one of those principles uh, it, it instructs that free markets uh, are not only right, those principles instruct that free markets are not only right, but they also make healthcare more universal. If what you want is to make healthcare better and more affordable and more secure and more universal for the sick, what you want is free markets. And there's a, next I want to discuss a little bit of the myth that exists in uh, both in the United States and here in Europe that what the United States has is a free market in healthcare, that the U.S. health sector is a free market. I'm going to give you uh, some data that usually does not enter that debate that may uh, clarify it, that show that, uh, or that suggest that maybe the United States health sector uh, might have one of the least free markets in healthcare among advanced nations. Uh, uh, I want to explore a little bit the question of which nation then might have the freest health sector, or, or how we, would we know, uh, before I give you some reasons for optimism for, uh, about reform here in the United States and in Europe, reforms that will genuinely make healthcare more universal. Uh, but now about that introduction. Uh, if I'm known for anything in this world, it is for the role I played in some challenges, what we now call in the United States Obamacare. This was a series of reforms that Congress passed and then the executive and the Supreme Court amended in the United States from about 2010 until 2015 that created a system of managed competition uh, in health insurance in the United States. And uh, I opposed uh, those sorts of reforms uh, then. I still oppose them today uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear. I w if I could eliminate those reforms today, I would. But when, uh, when Vox said that uh, I'm the man who could bring down Obamacare, well, I'll just say it hasn't happened yet. Those, the, those reforms are still functioning in the United States, I think much to the detriment of uh, people with expensive illnesses in the United States as well as healthy people in the United States. Uh, the principles that guide my work at the Cato Institute, you can read about them, and this is my latest book, Recovery, are, are basically two. That, when it, that people do have rights when it comes to their health care. The most important of those rights is the right to make one's own health decisions. And when governments respect those rights, uh, free markets make health care better and more affordable, more abundant, more secure, and more universal, and they do a better job of doing that than any government system has, or I would argue could. And there is evidence to, to support this proposition from the United States. So this slide shows the results of a series of experiments that happened when innovative insurance companies in the United States decided they would try to harness market mechanisms to bring down prices for various uh, medical services, various medical technologies. The insurance companies had been, their private insurance companies, they had been negotiating the best possible prices they could, but they were still getting indications that those prices were too high. And they said, why don't we make the patients cost conscious? Why don't we make the patients face the marginal price of these services so that if a hospital will pay them 30, will pay $30,000 for every hip or knee replacement, no matter where the patient goes, and if the hospital charges only $30,000, the patient will pay nothing out of pocket. But if the hospital charges $60,000, then the patient, and some hospitals were charging $60,000 for these procedures, and the insurers could not get those prices down. Then the patient will have to pay the balance, $30,000 out of pocket. An amazing thing happened that people tell us doesn't happen and can't happen in healthcare because healthcare is a special sector of the economy where market forces do not work. Market forces worked. 
the patients demanded once they faced the once they were price sensitive and faced the full mar marginal cost of those services, the patients demanded price information from their providers, which they usually don't get in the United States because they don't demand it. They demanded price information, which they usually don't do. They got the price information, which usually doesn't happen. And then uh, they acted on that price information. They switched from the high price hospitals to the low price hospitals. And that then forced uh, the healthcare providers to reduce their prices. It triggered price competition that lowered prices for all of these uh, services across the board. In some cases, dramatically, the high price hospitals lowered their prices for hip and knee replacements by 37% over a two year period. If you care about universality, if you care about bringing healthcare within the reach of people who cannot afford it today, this chart should be your obsession. Your obsession should be getting prices down because lower prices bring healthcare within the reach of more people and they make it, they, they shrink the population of people who cannot afford healthcare themselves and they make it easier for the rest of us to help those people. Uh, further evidence that respects the right of people to make their own health decisions, that markets bring forward better and more affordable health care. Innovators in the United States have developed health plans like Kaiser Permanente. There are others that are very nascent uh, uh, move, movements in, that dir in the direction of this sort of integrated health plan where both the insurance company and the health care providers work for the same entity, sort of like a private sector British National Health Service. Kaiser Permanente has survived in the United States despite government regulations that exist to block it and other regulations that frustrate it, but because it has survived, it has been able to do things that we don't see elsewhere in the United States, like electronic medical records that make healthcare more convenient for patients, and that also allow Kaiser to do research that identifies low-value care and even harmful care like the drug Vioxx. Who here remembers the drug Vioxx? Only a few hands going up. This was a COX-2 inhibitor, a painkiller, uh, one of a class of drugs that was supposed to be a breakthrough innovation in, in pain management, but it, it turned out that it causes heart attacks and it kills people. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved it anyway because they couldn't find that effect in the data. They, the data they had were not reliable enough because their clinical trials only had a few participants. But it was when Kaiser was able to use their electronic medical records to collect data on millions of, of users of this medication, they identified that, yes, in fact, this drug was causing heart attacks, and they identified and pulled from their formulary an unsafe drug faster than the government did, faster than the U.S. Food and Drug Administration did. And these health plans, no one had to direct Kaiser to do this from a central government bureau. This is what markets developed by themselves and would be developing more of if there weren't those regulations standing in the way. What this graph shows, and I apologize, this graph is a little complex. But what it illustrates is that markets are making health care, health insurance more affordable than the highly regulated products that the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare offers to people. Those, those blue dots that you see represent the lowest Obamacare premium, the premium for the least expensive Obamacare plan in all of the cities for a 64-year-old woman. And what the orange bars show is the range of premiums that health insurance plans that are exempt from Obamacare's regulations are for those same women in those same cities. And what you see is what uh, the uh, nonpartisan government agency, the Congressional Budget Office, has confirmed that free from those regulations, health insurers are able to offer health insurance that it is on average 60 percent less, it is often 60 percent less expensive than the health plans that the government designs and shapes with all of those regulations. And this is comprehensive health insurance, the Congressional Budget Office says, and we should all be cheering this. This is a wonderful innovation. We're bringing health insurance within the reach of people who otherwise might not be able to afford it. Uh, and yet, the Biden administration just moved to uh, not completely end that exemption, but to reduce the quality of these plans to the point where nobody wants to choose them. Further innovations, and I have an entire separate lecture that I would love to give to illustrate what this, uh, what the innovations that underlie this slide. But what this slide basically shows is the first columns, the blue ones, represent 
health insurance plans that markets developed, and the orange and gray columns represent health insurance plans that employers offer, which is basically a plan that government developed because the U.S. government offers a huge tax preference if you get health insurance through an employer, which means that in effect it penalizes the plans that people would buy on their own um, rather than through an employer. And yet, despite that in, it, huge tax penalty that averages about 33%, what the market developed was plans that make health insurance more secure for sick people. What this graph shows is the, the share of people in each of these types of plans, 28-year-old males but the numbers are, and females, but the numbers are similar for different age groups, who end up uninsured after one year by health insurance plan type. And what this shows is that markets were doing as well or better than the government was at making health insurance more secure for sick people. Whereas the with the, gover the insurance that government favored, people would lose their health insurance after they got sick and then have an uninsured, an uninsurable pre-existing condition, markets developed innovations that made that happen less often and could be getting those numbers the, for the blue bars, 24 and 20 and 17 percent down even further. But in 2014, with Obamacare, government outlawed the plans that were beating and uh, the government uh, favored employer uh, plans uh, at making health insurance more secure. And there could have been more innovations that made health insurance even more secure. In fact, in that other presentation, I explain how market innovators were filling in the gaps that existed in employer-sponsored insurance before the government outlawed those innovations. That one breaks my heart. Now, you've probably heard some version of this claim by The Economist. That, uh, the, that, if, uh, that the United States has a free market in health care and, uh, and that that is, and people then uh, from that premise will go on to claim that any problem you see in the U.S. health sector will that it must be uh, a result of free markets. Markets failing in health care because health care is a special sector of the economy where markets do not work. And there's certainly some support for uh, those two, that, that one premise and that conclusion. If you look at the tax burden in the United States, you see that it's much lower than most uh, advanced nations. This is from 2020. The taxes consumed about 25% of GDP in the United States, much lower than 45% in Denmark and lots of other European countries. Also, the private, private health spending in the United States makes up a larger share of total health spending uh, than in other uh, advanced countries. You can see in Great Britain and the less, private health spending is a much smaller share. So it might be, it's reasonable to surmise that, uh, or to hypothesize that the problems that we see in the U.S. health sector might be the result of that. And those problems are many. Prices in the United States are well above average prices for medical goods and services in OECD countries, about 43% higher than the OECD average. And the volume of services, the quantity of services that consumers receive in the United States is about 49% higher. Um, and that you combine those two together, per capita health spending is more than two times the OECD average in the United States. And uh, as a share of GDP, uh, the United States is, has far and away, uh, the health sector in the United States consumes far and away a larger share of GDP than any other nation's health sector at about 16 or 17 percent. So if the United States has a, uh, has a free market in health care, it might be reasonable to conclude that this is what free markets produce. And most troublingly, you know, those are all inputs that we were looking at. Here we're finally incorporating some outputs. Uh, most troublingly, if you look at health outcomes metrics, the United States appears to fare poorly relative to its, uh, uh, its, its wealthiest, uh, its wealthiest um, uh, counterparts across the globe. Uh, the, the, the graph on the left shows health spending on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. Where you want to be is up here in this quadrant, where uh, you will find a lot of European countries. Where you do not want to be is down here where the United States is, where health spending is high, but life expectancy is relatively low, 95% of the OECD average, which is what this line represents. Uh, similar story when it comes to avoidable mortality in the second figure. 
Uh, health spending in the United States is high, and here you want to be below the average. You want avoidable mortality to be low, but instead avoidable mortality in the United States is above the OECD average. So if I thought that free markets were contributing to these problems, you, you know, that I, I might be against them. But let's start to talk about some of the features of, let's examine some of the features of the U.S. health sector and see if, what kind of conclusions we can reach about whether the United States has a free market in the health care or how free that market is and how those features might be contributing to the, uh, the, the uh, data, the outcomes that we're seeing. Most people in the United States have health insurance through, uh, through an employer. Uh, this is not unlike uh, there are differences, but this is not unlike the system that they have in Germany. In the United States, about half or more of the population has health insurance through an employer, and that insurance is compulsory. Either you enroll in an employer-sponsored health insurance plan, or you do have to pay a penalty, an implicit but a very real penalty, uh, to the taxing authorities. Uh, I like to say that not only does the United States have uh, socialized medicine, it has every social form of socialized medicine that you will find in Europe and across the globe, and even some that no other nation has developed. Uh, one of, uh, another form of socialized medicine that we have in the United States is like the Canadian Medicare program. We call this program, uh, our, our version of that Canadian program, Medicaid, but it is a program where the national government takes money and sends it out to lower levels of government so that they can operate a universal health system for a population of people. In Canada, that population is the entire population of the province. Uh, in the United States, states get money from the, federal, the national government to operate a health insurance scheme for, lo uh, for low-income people, mostly low-income people. There's some upper-income people who sneak in there, too. Uh, so in, in the United States, we have a version of the Canadian health system. We call it the Medicaid program. We also have in the United States a version of the British National Health Service. It's a, it covers a very small share of the population, about 1% of the population, who are veterans of the U.S. military. That is uh, a, a, the, the Veterans Health Administration, which is a, 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 a government sector version of Kaiser Permanente, or an American version of the British National Health Service, where the health insurer and the, uh, uh, and the health care providers and facilities all fall under the same corporate umbrella, an integrated health system, if you will. So we have the British version of socialized medicine as well. We have uh, a, a, actually a couple uh, examples of what they call managed competition, uh, like you'll find in Netherlands or in Switzerland, where you have multiple private insurers competing for consumers who can choose among them in a very heavily regulated market uh, with price controls on health insurance and requirements about what types of benefits the insurers have to cover and so forth. Uh, we have that in what we call the individual market in the United States since 2014. We've had it in other places before that, the health plan for federal employees, and now the Medicare program is basically uh, shares those features. Uh, the Medicare program, which covers about 66 million uh, U.S. Re residents, about 15 percent of the population, or actually more, you'll see in a moment, uh, this is the United States' big innovation when it comes to socialized medicine. There is no other nation in the world that has a, a health insurance scheme like the U.S. Medicare program. It is a, pr a program where a national government provides health insurance to 66, a population of 66 million enrollees and where it sets the prices for all of the services that it purchases uh, across that vast population, across a vast nation like the United States, um, more than a, prices for more than a billion transactions every year. And as if you measure in terms of dollars, the Medicare, U.S. Medicare program is the largest purchaser of health services in the entire world. There's no nation that can uh, there, So, yay, go America. Um, there's still another segment of the population that has both the Canadian version of Medicare and the U.S. version of Medicare. We call these dual eligible enrollees. They uh, have coverage through both of those programs. There's no nation that I'm aware of that, uh, well, by definition, if there's no Medicare, there's no uh, U.S. Medicare anywhere else. There's no nation that could do this. And you've probably all heard of this share of the U.S. population, about 8% who have no health insurance at all. Now, 
This also seems to be a distinctly American uh, feature of the US health sector. And it is one of the more troubling features, maybe not the most troubling feature of the US health sector, but one of the reasons that we have uh, such a large uninsured population, the main reason we do, is that healthcare is so unaffordable in the United States. The prices are so far above market levels, and the reason for that lies in all of these other, in, mostly in all of these other interventions that the government has uh, launched into the health sector. Because, uh, as we'll see in a moment, these interventions give government a tremendous amount of power in the US health sector, and what do they do with that power? Well, first, how about a measure of how much power that is? You've probably seen lots of data from the OECD comparing international health systems, and I'll have, uh, and you've already seen some here. Uh, but one uh, comparison that, uh, that the OECD puts out that gets not nearly the attention it deserves is their me measure of how much of each advanced nation's health spending is voluntary versus compulsory. I'll make that graph easier to read in a moment. Don't, you don't have to squint and try to read all of the, uh, the x-axis labels right now. But this is the share of health spending that, that consumers control versus the health spending that government controls. So strip away the labels of public or private, but looking at both government expenditures and private sector expenditures, which of these uh, expenditures are compulsory versus voluntary? Compulsory meaning, Either you spend it the way the government wants or you pay a penalty. Well, the United States fares pretty poorly or on this metric, or maybe if your preferences are for government intervention, pretty well. Uh, the OECD says that the United, in the United States, government controls, makes compulsory, about 85% of health spending. That is very close to the number one nation, uh, which is Germany at 87%. The United States, which supposedly has a free market in healthcare, is in a dead statistical heat on this metric, with France and Czechia and Denmark and Norway. It, in the United States, government uh, controls a larger share of health spending than in the, than in the United Kingdom, which has a fully socialized uh, health system, the National Health Service. A larger share than you will find here in Slovakia or in Austria, Poland, or even in Canada, which also has a fully socialized health system. This is not what we would expect to see if we were looking at a system with a, uh, with a free market, or even a market that is freer than most. This suggests that the United States has a market that is more, a healthcare market that is more dominated by government than most. And all of these interventions give uh, the government in the United States all of that power over health spending. What does the government do with that power? Well, as I explained in a, a recent book uh, by the Cato Institute, uh, it, it, to which I contributed a chapter, uh, it sets uh, most of the prices for medical care in the United States, either directly or indirectly, uh, through uh, these and other powers. And uh, it also uses those powers to encourage people to purchase or to provide them directly more comprehensive insurance than they would otherwise purchase, which drops down the share of spending that consumers do themselves. Out-of-pocket spending in the United States, after decades of government intervention, constitutes a lower share of health spending than it does in almost every other advanced nation. It's about 11% right now. Only France and a couple of other countries are lower. Uh, that is a lower share of the health spending uh, that you will f than you will find in completely socialized systems like the British National Health Service and the Canadian Medicare. This graph shows what has happened to out of the share of health spending that patients do themselves, that is out-of-pocket spending, ever since 1961, before Congress enacted the Medicare and Medicaid programs here in 1965, that share was already spending, uh, that share was already falling uh, thanks to uh, the tax preference for employer-sponsored health insurance and other government interventions, and it just continued to fall with Medicare and Medicaid, and as those programs expanded, and as, uh, as Congress expanded those programs and created new uh, government programs uh, and mandates that insurers cover more and more services, regulations that require that. And what happened as out-of-pocket spending was falling, what happened to prices? Well, these two lines, the blue and the orange lines, show the price indices for uh, medical services 
and how much, uh, and medical goods and medical services, and how much those uh, price, uh, those prices rose over above general inflation. If healthcare prices rose no faster than general inflation over this period, those two lines would be flat along the x-axis. Instead, prices have risen dramatically at the same time government has made consumers less and less price sensitive, which is what we would expect. We would also expect to see uh, a real per capita health spending also grew uh, according, you know, as theory would predict, uh, it grew dramatically from less than $2,000 in 1961 to nearly, uh, what is that? I think it's $13,000 in 2021. Uh, that is, of course, prices times quantity. Uh, and I think that the, the, the out-of-pocket uh, uh, falling, uh, falling price sensitivity among consumers also leads to uh, uh, a greater volume of services as well as higher prices. Now, this is obviously not causality. We, there are a lot of other things going on here. But we have more direct evidence about the effect of insurance on healthcare prices. Uh, one of them was that those experiments that I showed you at the beginning, that where in, in price sensitive consumers got prices down lower than insurers were able to negotiate them. But here's another uh, uh, more piece of more direct evidence. Starting in 2011, but taking effect fully in 2014, uh, in the United States were regulations required insurance companies to cover prescription contraceptives at 100%. Prior to that regulation, there could be cost sharing, there could be co-insurance, or maybe the insurer didn't cover contraceptives at all. When that regulation took full effect, the patient was supposed to be paying nothing out of pocket. So these, these, this regula regulation made contraceptives free what happened? Well, prior to those effect, the prices for hormones and oral contraceptives were holding steady in inflation-adjusted terms or even falling relative to inflation. So real prices for these items were really falling. Uh, but what happened as, those, uh, as that re regulation took effect and after that regulation took effect, prices skyrocketed because the producers knew that their consumers, their, their, their customers, were no longer going to switch to a lower price product. Why would they? It wouldn't save them any money. It would only save the insurers money. And so, yet again, government in the United States implemented a regulation that caused prices to climb. So this is something I need, think we need to keep in mind when we hear that free markets are driving up prices, uh, healthcare prices in the United States. Now, there's another effect of, of the, uh, of government encouraging higher prices in, for medical care in the United States. It means the rewards to innovation are tremendous. And the United States, far and away, uh, is a le world leader in new medical innovations, new treatments, new uh, diagnostic tests, and even cures like sofosbuvir, which is, uh, which you may know by the brand name Sivaldi, which is a cure for hepatitis C. Cures 95% of patients with hepatitis C, uh, reduces all-cause mortality among hepatitis C patients by 50%. This is a miracle drug. It came from the United States. Uh, it was scientists in the United States who developed it, pharmaceutical companies in the United States who brought it to market through uh, the regulatory approval process, and then shipped it around the world. Uh, so there is that, that advantage, and that does shed light on these outcomes metrics. Because remember, the United States, you don't want to be in this region right here, but one of the reasons, or this region over here, but one of the reasons that these other nations are not in uh, over there and why they have, are moving in the direction that you want all nations to go uh, toward uh, longer life expectancy and lower avoidable mortality is that innovations from the United States don't just remain within the United States, they disseminate all around the world and they save lives in Slovakia and they save lives in Britain and they save lives in Canada and Australia. Uh, improving those nations' health statistics while making the United States look worse on both of these metrics because health spend, the health spending that goes into developing those innovations appears, uh, uh, moves the United States farther along the x-axis. And so 
when you look at the impact of all of these policies that government of the United States implements that drive up health spending, drive up prices, drive up the volume of services, it sheds light on that metric that the OECD puts out that health spending consumes 16.6% .6 of GDP in the United States. Yes, that is a larger share of GDP than in any other advanced nation. But notice something. If you look at the share, but, uh, why is that? Why is that such a high share? Is it because of markets? Or is it because when you look at the share of uh, GDP that goes to compulsory health spending, it's a little more than 14% which is more, a larger share of GDP than any other nation spent on healthcare in total, it becomes clear that the reason the United States spends more on healthcare than any other nation is not because that's what, not just because that's what free markets deliver, it's because that's what government in the United States requires. Uh, the OECD shows us that that is, uh, that is why health spending in the United States is so high, it's because the government uh, compels it. Oh, that's a very helpful line I put in there. And there are other indications that, uh, that uh, U.S. residents may be less free uh, and, that the, and that healthcare markets in the United States might be less free than in other advanced nations. These are some data that came from a government report in 2009 that measured the, uh, the, the freedom that consumers in different countries have to access the medicines that they want. The blue bars mean that you have more freedom, uh, and the orange bars you know, mean that you have less. Uh, what it was measuring are uh, the, the scope of regulations requiring consumers to obtain prescriptions before they purchase certain medicines. And uh, what the study found is that in the United States, those regulations are about as burdensome as they are in, in Netherlands and, uh, and in Italy, but in Australia and in the United Kingdom, uh, consumers have far more freedom to buy the, uh, the, the medicines they want without government getting in the way or requiring them to get permission from a government-appointed gatekeeper, in other words, a doctor. And a particularly, uh, what I think is a particularly glaring example of that phenomenon is that uh, unlike 100 countries around the, United, uh, around the world, the United States after 60 years still requires women to obtain a prescription before they can purchase uh, daily use oral contraceptives. In most countries around the world, that is not the case. Women have more freedom to purchase uh, those, uh, to purchase those, uh, those medicines. You will notice that the United States is not alone. That is true in Canada. It's true in most European nations, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, some Southern African nations, and Australia. Uh, so you might think, well, this means that, it's the, that this is a progressive step that these governments are taking uh, by protecting women from making these decisions themselves. But before you go too far with that argument, remember uh, that it's not just uh, those nations that are, protect, that are requiring women to obtain prescriptions. Saudi Arabia, which is not known for its progressive attitude toward women, is also imposing those requirements. So that should give us all a little pause about their wisdom. These, these interventions... These government interventions in healthcare in the United States are incredibly resilient. They're incredibly difficult to get rid of. And that's because every government subsidy, every government tax preference for healthcare, every regulation contributes to the income of some healthcare provider or some other healthcare interest or business interest. And uh, removing it would threaten their incomes. And those healthcare interests all have lobbyists, and they all spend money to try to protect those government interventions because they don't want free markets. What they want is protection. For, they want government subsidies and all other forms of government protection from competition. And lobbying, healthcare lobbying in the United States is a robust industry. You may have heard of uh, the U.S. military. Have you heard of any of their work? Yes? Yeah? Maybe you've had some exposure to them. It's a pretty big enterprise. A pretty vast, uh, as militaries go, it is uh, uh, one of or the largest military in the world, and yet, and it enriches a lot of defense contractors, okay? Defense contractors spend uh, less than $200 million in 2023, spent less than $200 million lobbying the U.S. government to try to expand the U.S. military. 
The health sector of the economy spent almost six times as much as the defense industry lobbying Congress to create or to preserve government regulations, government subsidies, and tax preferences that enrich the health sector. So when free market, again, these people are not lobbying for free markets. I have been, I live in the DC area, I've been uh, arguing for freer markets in healthcare for 20 years, and these folks are not on the side of free markets. Um, uh, this is a, not only is it interesting in itself, it, it's another indication, indirect evidence, of just how not free the US health sector is. And lest you think that, well, okay, the United States is, it, 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 it has problems, but really the problem is the private sector. It, the private sector is still playing too large of a role, and if we just gave the government more control over the health sector, then finally we would be able to get prices down. Uh, I want to draw your attention to these data right here, which come from a study in the journal of the American Medical Association, which came out just in the last few months, uh, that measured uh, health spending by age in the United States versus uh, the average health spending for people of that age in a collection of other advanced nations. And what it found was that on average, in the United States, this is this first orange bar is for all ages, on average, uh, we spend 70% more than other nations do. Those are those seven nations. On healthcare, across all ages, that's the average. But what's the case for, for people over age 65, age 65 and older, who are in the US Medicare program, a universal government-run program for all seniors in the United States? Covers like 97, 99% of US seniors. Well, it turns out that spending is even higher than the average of those other nations in the US Medicare program. So whatever the problem is in the US health sector, I don't, this is just handing uh, the rest of the health sector over to government is not going to solve it. It's certainly not going to bring spending down. Uh, we're back here. I can't remember why. Uh, those aren't the only interventions uh, into, the, uh, the, 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 or, uh, into the health sector that make the US health sector less free. Every state in the United States imposes regulations that bar entry into the health professions. We call these clinician licensing laws. Those laws disrupt, they block the division of labor from making healthcare more affordable. This is one example of how they do that. Dental therapists are a category of clinicians that have less training than a dentist, but more than a dental hygienist. They can perform basic procedures like uh, filling cavities or simple tooth extractions, and they can do it more affordably than dentists can because their student debt burden is lower. They don't have to charge higher prices. And the darker states here, the dark blue states, are allowing dental therapists to practice and expand access to dental care, bringing dental care within the reach of lower, lower and lower income people all the time. The green states are prohibiting them from practicing, which keeps prices high, pricing health care out of the reach of low income people, making health care less of a free market and less universal. I mentioned Kaiser Permanente a number of times before, those same regulations that are blocking the division of labor are also blocking innovative health systems like Kaiser Permanente and nascent efforts to create more of them across the US health sector. These could be tremendous quality improvements and reducing the price of health insurance, but government uh, continues to block them through easily a dozen different interventions. Telehealth. Telehealth is a wonderful, promising innovation that can make access to care more convenient and reduce the price of health care, making it more universal. Every state in the United States blocks tele interstate telehealth in one way or another. Uh, here, the, the gold states are better than the blue states, which are better than the red states. They're pretty terrible. I want to draw your attention to California and Oregon over here on the coast, on the west coast, and then Georgia down here on the East Coast and Massachusetts way up here. Those four states will become important. Why? Because I want to introduce you first to Shelley Horowitz. Shelley Horowitz lives in Northern California. She has hemophilia. And her doctors in Portland, Oregon, which is across the border, would love to be able to treat her over the internet via telehealth. California regulations prohibit it. So Shelley has to get in her car and drive 600 kilometers 
from her home to Portland, Oregon, just to see her doctors. Those regulations make healthcare less universal. Uh, on the right, we have Helen Curry. Helen Curry is or was a student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. In order to see the, do the to get the treatment she wanted from providers in Boston, Massachusetts, you remember how many how far away that was, how many states away that was? Yeah, keep keep that mental image in mind. She could not see them over the internet. She could not participate in this teletreatment over the internet because Georgia prohibited it. And so did every state between Georgia and Massachusetts. So Helen Curry had to get in her car and drive 1,600 kilometers from Atlanta, Georgia to Massachusetts, rent a hotel room just to participate in a telehealth uh, treatment that, uh, that uh, providers in Massachusetts were offering. Again, regulation is increasing the cost of health care, blocking access, and making it less universal. I offered you some reason for hope, and here I want to provide it. There has been a movement in some states to try to liberalize, to try to tear down these barriers to more universal health care. The uh, dark uh, blue or teal or greenish states, whatever you want to call that color, the darker states have enacted some reforms that recognize licenses, occupational licenses from other states. Not all of these, uh, they're, they're pretty weak reforms. Some of them don't even include health care. I live in the Commonwealth of Virginia over here. Health professionals don't even fall under this liberalization. So there, it, with respect to health care, there has been no liberalization there in Virginia. But some of the other states do, such as Arizona. Arizona's is one of the best laws. There has been some recognition uh, that these laws create barriers to affordable and universal health care. COVID actually helped because when COVID hit, a lot of states just, governors by fiat, just uh, suspended all of these uh, anti-universal health care regulations, uh, but then allowed them to take effect again after COVID passed. Still, there has been legislative action uh, and movement on uh, uh, in these states, there are still some forms of health insurance that are exempt from the regulations that are making health insurance in the United States so expensive. They are available uh, and, and, and that uh, are killing the sorts of innovations that make health insurance more secure. Uh, on f <laughs> those regulations uh, are not only making health insurance more expensive and less secure, they are harming real people, like Colette Briggs. Colette Briggs is now about 11 years old. I remember that age. I remember her age because she's the same age as my twins, my twin son and daughter. But when my twin son and daughter were busy being happy, healthy, playful kids at age three, Colette got a diagnosis of leukemia. And if the government had just left her alone, her family had one of these, one of these health plans, one of these uh, uh, affordable, secure health plans that cut, would have covered the care that she needed. But because of the Affordable Care Act or Obama's regulations, uh, which penalize high quality coverage for the sick, Colette's family had to scramble to get the care that she needed because the, government regulate, the government's regulations kept penalizing insurers if they provided her the care that she needed. So that is why, as I said at the beginning, if I could get rid of, the, uh, of Obamacare, I would do it in a heartbeat because it harms patients like Colette. And according to uh, one of President Joe Biden's economic advisors, uh, those regulations that mean that even healthy people in Obamacare cannot get adequate insurance. Fortunately, there are still plans that are exempt from those regulations. The Obama administration exempted the health insurance markets in U.S. territories, like the U.S. Virgin Islands, from Obamacare's most burdensome regulations. And what that means is that you can still find affordable, secure health insurance in those territories. It also means that any state, because states regulate health insurance just like they regulate clinicians, any state can liberalize by recognizing insurance licenses from the U.S. Virgin Islands or other U.S. territories and give every employer in their state and every consumer in their state access to more affordable health insurance, or at least the vast majority access to more affordable health insurance than the gov than government regulations currently allow. Um, 
I'm probably running over on time, so I'll skip right past my reform of managed competition, my, uh, the reforms I propose for managed competition systems. I'm eager to talk about those because I understand that uh, in Slovakia you have a system that closely resembles managed competition. Uh, uh, another reason for optimism is there have been reforms in the United States that allow workers to control a portion of the trillion dollars of their er er annual earnings that government, that federal tax policy let employers control. That tiny little sliver down there is the share of those earnings, about 4%, that tax-free health savings accounts in the United States let workers control. And expanding on tax-free health savings accounts could allow workers to control all trillion dollars of those earnings which would be the most important thing we could do to bring health care within the reach of the poor because the price sensitivity and price competition that that would trigger if consumers got to spend that money themselves would be revolutionary and make health care more universal by driving down prices uh, as we see here. I've come to the end of uh, my reasons for optimism in my presentation. I want to thank you all again. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, say so I'm eager to hear the other speakers and eager to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you.